So we'll go. Joe, hello. How you doing? I'm great, Matt. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, it's been a lovely day here where I am. Has it been a nice morning where you are? It has. I mean, frankly, this winter season up in Boston has been to die for. Uh, you know, one out of every three or four days has been 60 degrees or higher, so I really can't complain. It's It's been a beautiful winter season so far, and today is yet another one. It's very sunny outside, so nothing to complain about. Lovely, lovely stuff. So for anyone that isn't aware of Joe Consorti, can you give us, please, a brief introduction of yourself? Absolutely, yeah. So I'm a market analyst over at the Bitcoin Layer. Uh, I work with Nick Batio, who is the author of Layered Money and a adjunct professor of fixed income over at USC Marshall. And together we write and produce uh, Bitcoin and markets research. We'll do that in video form on YouTube. And we do that for Substack subscribers, obviously, in written form. And uh, it's an extremely fun time. And we essentially provide readers with everything that they need to know when it comes to Bitcoin and markets uh, so that they're up to speed, whether they're trading on our information or more often than not, whether when they're just using it to keep up to date uh, and to know what is going on, right? We're that, that lighthouse in the foggy morning dew that is markets. Um, and, uh, very fun times. So that's what I do. Um, I'm responsible for, uh, doing some of the videos and doing a great deal of the sub stack work as well. And Nick and I have been working together for about a year and a half. Lovely stuff and a great Bitcoin layer sales pitch. I'll need to up my look into Bitcoin pimping skills. So obviously working for the Bitcoin layer and providing some Bitcoin insights, analysis, et cetera. How did you initially get into Bitcoin? Right. So this was after a, uh, a summer. It was really interesting. I had been sent home from school because of uh, COVID. The, the government shut everything down and the school sent everybody home. And so I was uh, initially going for spring break and then they sent me home completely. And so we weren't allowed to go back and get more than the stuff we took for spring break. In my case, I took like an overnight bag, some clothes, like three or four changes of clothes. Didn't take my computer. Naturally, I I left that stuff there and I wasn't allowed to go back and get it, um, which is very kind of them. And so at that point, uh, I started getting really jaded towards authority figures. Um, and uh, it wasn't too long before Bitcoin sort of came into that. Um, that summer, I started running a uh, painting business and um that went very well uh, i did like a hundred one thousand dollars in revenue revenue right. enough and then um using the profit from that summer i had a decent amount to deploy and um i was kind of just sitting on it idly in cash and bitcoin was around nine or eleven thousand at this point um in in october my buddy tyler laroche he sent me two articles Masters and Slaves of Money by Robert Breedlove and The Bullish Case for Bitcoin by Vijay Boyapati. I read both of those. Absolutely love them. Um, and uh, started um, really, really heavily researching Bitcoin more. And after a while, I decided to deploy the capital that I had, all of it, into Bitcoin. I had the strong convictions in it. And if I was going to invest in something, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to take the route of allocating to a 60-40 portfolio when I'm 19 years old. Uh, I'd much rather take the route of having conviction in an asset and then throwing my entire weight behind an asset. Because ultimately, the way things are headed right now, we are in this regime of financial repression in order for the United States government to fix its own debt problem rather than being austere, paying back what it owes and taking on less debt. It's simply allowing rates, nominal yields to run lower than price inflation for several years, a sustained period of time. So the buck gets passed to the American public in the form of devalued wealth, while the American government delays having to pay off its debt and eventually inevitably pays it off uh, or doesn't in uh, very devalued money. And so that means for the individual, the old investing strategies of you know risk-adjusted returns, uh, and, you know, uh, a good uh, portfolio with an excellent sharp ratio uh, 
you know, those those are kind of a thing of the past as a function of what the Fed and the U.S. Treasury are doing explicitly and uh, behind closed doors and what their intentions are. Um, modern day investing is kind of broken because of that. And so I threw my whole way behind Bitcoin, right? A great deal of money into Bitcoin. And that was right before the 2021 um, bull run. And I rode that all the way to the top. Extremely exhilarating stuff. I initially got in, of course, as most people do because number go up. But uh, all the while, um, I, I grew. I, I had this fascin fascination with markets. The time that I spent at college, um, I used the Bloomberg terminal in the school library very regularly. I was probably I frequented it the most out of anybody that I knew, and um, you know because of that. I ended up becoming very literate in that. And also I, I really love, I love patterns and I love uh, noticing the way that things interact with one another and markets were just another extension of that. I love numbers. I love, you know, all that, all that stuff. And so this fascination that I had with markets, it hadn't even sort of crossed over into Bitcoin. So I was still just so sort of enthralled by this asset. And then around the uh, summer of 2021, into the fall of 2021, I started, um, you know, more formally analyzing and researching markets. And then, uh, I, I started posting my findings on Twitter shortly thereafter about October or September or October of 2021. And then fast forward to May of the following year, uh, I had been consistently posting my markets analysis. And uh, Nick found me on Twitter. So through a mutual friend of ours, Matt Snow, who was introduced to me by my friend Tyler, who initially brought me into Bitcoin, um, Nick found me and was looking for someone just like me, looking for a research associate who was willing to learn. Um, and so since May of last year, Nick has been not just my colleague at the Bitcoin layer, but a close mentor of mine in teaching me his markets framework and enabling me to analyze markets with a much finer comb and a much more accurate magnifying glass. And that's what we've been working on for the last year and a half. And so going from getting kicked out of school to running that business, to having money to deploy, not knowing where to put it, learning about Bitcoin via a friend, and then through the grapevine via connections made with that same friend, meeting Nick uh, and really turning the Bitcoin layer from a, um, a personal newsletter to a multifaceted, multi-platform media brand. So that's kind of what I do. That's how I discovered, uh, that's how I got into Bitcoin. And that's why I spent my time doing that. That was the most in-depth and thorough response to how did you get into Bitcoin I could have imagined, which is great. Thank you very much for that. So on to this, obviously, I think most people first get into Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, like you said, because number go up. And your strategy was just to go 100% all in BTC. Is that still your strategy? Are you still just buying every opportunity you have, or are you a little bit more precise with your investments now? For sure. So the two assets that I own, um, and I own for the sake of owning, of course I do like, you know, I do trading here and there, but nothing insane. But I don't do, you know, I, I do more long time frame swing trades that I really have high conviction in. But the majority of my wealth is put into A Bitcoin and B cash. When I say cash, I mean uh, not just the dollar, but dollar equivalents, i.e. U.S. treasuries. So I have a lot of money in the dollar, and I also am scaling into U.S. treasuries. I started doing that. Um, I started really heavily investing into U.S. treasuries um, last October, perhaps not the greatest timing in the world because yields have continued to, to go up. I thought that we had reached our, our highs for the cycle last October. Evidently, we didn't. Um, so those are the, those are the two assets that I own primarily, uh, because cash is obviously, when I say cash, I mean the U S dollar and all of its most liquid instruments that can be readily converted and, uh, and sold at any given point, they are the most popular assets in the world. And so for me, that is what I want to hold my, my money in when I'm not in Bitcoin, when I'm going from periods of risk off to risk on vice versa, when I'm. Uh, you know, when I'm selling here at a little here at local highs, when I'm when I'm buying uh, a boatload, you know, at at cycle lows, 
I, I want to be taking from and giving to an asset that's not just going to be sitting there, like in my bank account, for example, uh, in any given student checking account, because most students are financially literate, they'll give you like 0.05% you know, savings. That's nothing. I mean, it's, we talk about the U.S. government letting nominal yields run lower than CPI inflation. Uh, your savings account at 0.5%, you're getting trounced. You're getting absolutely demolished. And so uh, just putting that money that you would otherwise put in savings account into treasuries that right now on the front end are yielding like 4.5%, something insane like that, of course, that's a, that's a much better decision. So that's what I've that's what I've been doing, um, rotating into and out of treasuries in Bitcoin. But but for now, I'm sitting uh, a great deal uh, in Bitcoin. And yeah, those are those are the two assets that I spend my time with, uh, and a, a great deal of my time, more so than than sitting and making these small granular trades and make these much bigger bigger trades that involve allocating and reallocating huge portions of my wealth. I do that on a multi month, uh, multi year time frame. I spend much more time. Um, researching markets and then boiling it down either within 280 characters for Twitter or uh, in the form of a video or a Substack piece. And that's what I really, really love doing. So uh, when it comes to trading, uh, I dabble. I, I'm illiterate enough in it to not lose money, but I, I vastly prefer spending my time in uh, researching and uh, reporting on markets. Very good. Fair enough. And you said before that you didn't want to have a traditional 60-40 equity bonds portfolio allocation, but you're now Bitcoin and bonds. What Can you give a little bit of a, a rough estimate of what percentages is in which and which is in the other? And if you're transitioning, like you said, more and more potentially into bonds as Bitcoin starts exponentially increasing, do you think Bitcoin and bonds is the new 60-40 potentially? Yeah. So right, right now I'm around 60-40 I'm around Bitcoin bonds. Um, Yields are obviously insanely attractive right now. They continue to be insanely attractive. And so long as the U.S. Treasury continues its really strong issuance schedule and the cracks in the consumer don't spill over into a huge uh, economic labor market unwind, we're, we're nearing that, but we're not quite there yet. So long as that continues to happen and yields continue pushing higher, um, the bonds that I own will continue uh, uh, rising um, in the... Uh, in value that I can inevitably go ahead and sell them for. And so for me, owning bonds here is a, is an excellent move. I mean, and continuing to, as yields go up, um, scale into bonds, inevitably when, when yields fall, uh, you're going to have, and, and for me particularly, I, I own a, great, a fair bit of duration. When yields end up falling, I'm going to have a lot of price appreciation on my side that I can then go and sell. And so for me, it's about 60, 40. Um, but by the same token, Bitcoin is also performing very, very well. Um, it is up relative to the S and P 500, which is up 15% since this time last year. Um, Bitcoin is up 126%. Uh, the magnificent seven, obviously the largest, uh, U S equities by market cap are up 58%. And so that is the, you know, even the, the, the cohort of assets that are or the absolute best over the last year, um, or even don't even, can't, can't even reach 50% of what Bitcoin is able to do this year. So you, you have that really high beta with Bitcoin in your portfolio. And because this has been such a risk on year to everyone's surprise, having an outsized amount of that high beta in your portfolio has really, really benefited you if you've chosen to, to do that. Um, towards the start of the year, uh, I, like most other people, were, were wrong about the way that, that things would shake out. I reallocated and readjusted, and um, and here we are today. Bitcoin is, is absolutely trouncing everything else. And so uh, I do view a recession, and of course, with the recession comes rate cuts on the horizon. Um, and uh, inevitably, that's that's why it's uh, it's such a <laughs> it's such a delightful play um, to be uh, to be owning bonds here. Um, people people are going to want to continue scaling into. Uh, bonds as a recession comes uh, draws closer. Uh, people can rag on them all they want, but there's only real one real flight to safety asset. It hasn't been gold during receptions. Um, it certainly, of course, has not been Bitcoin. Bitcoin is trades like the NASDAQ. It has been U.S. Treasuries. And so with rates where they are, like 4.5% on the front end, 5, 5.5% 5 uh, as you move out the curve, when a recession comes and rate cuts come, 
people are going to be piling into bonds. Um, and so if I own the 10 year at 5% or five and a half percent, and all of a sudden within two weeks, it goes to 1%, I, I can sell my 5% bond for an insane markup because what I have, uh, people will want, um, and I can, I can sell it at the prevailing market yield instead of my 5% yield. And so that's why my price appreciates so much. So like as a recession nears, it's good to own the percentage of bonds that I do, but I'm also still riding this Bitcoin wave for the time being. Um, one of the things that Nick is really imbued in me, uh, when it comes to a markets framework is that you can't, you can disagree with the market and say that it's irrational and you can say that, uh, for example, right now, this insane risk on rally that we're experiencing is totally irrational, but the one thing you shouldn't do is trade against it, right? Um, you ultimately have to have to listen, listen to the market and, uh, you know, if, if you fight the wave in the form of being on the wrong side of the trade, eventually you'll go bankrupt. You, you can have your own personal conviction, but if the market is headed a certain way, then you, you have to understand market psychology to a certain degree to understand why it's doing what it's doing and then just ride the wave. Um, and so right now I'm not disagreeing with the market. I have a very heavy allocation to Bitcoin and I have a uh, pretty large and increasing allocation into treasuries as, um, of course, as we reach peak monetary tightness and our recession is right around the corner. So I can benefit from that. I'll still benefiting from Bitcoin. Nice, nice, nice approach. And one of the primary reasons I was so excited to have you on is your views and expertise on traditional markets. And you've mentioned that you believe a recession is just around the corner. Could you give a little bit more of an insight and potentially the time frame you're looking at? Do you think we're three to six months away from a big drawdown period in traditional markets and subsequently Bitcoin? Or do you think we're maybe a couple of years away? How do you think that's going to play out? Yeah, I think we've, you know, I'll preface that with saying that this cycle has caught everyone, everyone who's honest with themselves off guard. Um, there have been some people who have said, wait, wait, wait. Uh, but but the lion's share of people thought that when you started to see the hallmarks of recession, um, you know, like the unemployment rate starting to pick up pretty, pretty soon, and would like uh, price inflation falling for 90 consecutive months. Um, those sorts of things would eventually snowball into recession and a recession much sooner um, than what we have now. It's currently no recession whatsoever. Um, anyone who's honest with themselves is probably predicting uh, a really uh, severe, if not severe, then just a an economic downturn of some kind uh, at the very least by the middle of this year. And we haven't we haven't had that. And by all accounts, we're not going to have that for, for a little bit of time. Um, this segue has caught everybody off guard and I have a feeling as many people do, it has something to do with the uh, insane monetary and fiscal cannon that were shot off into the real economy during 2020 and 2021. And we think of cycles as, um, you know, moving around a mean, as ebbing and flowing, you know, up and down around a mean. And we view um, 2020 and 2021 as shooting way above that mean uh, in terms of economic growth because of that monetary fiscal stimulus. And it also stands to reason that the downturn would take a decent chunk of time too. In order to return to the mean and go below the mean, uh, it's going to take more time than would otherwise it would otherwise take during a normal cycle because of that huge cannon that was shot into the economy. Um, that huge adrenaline shot. We're still coming down from that high, evidently so. I mean, consumers have now found consumers. Uh, you know, they're propping themselves up on buy now, pay later schemes. So they're taking advantage of the the tried and true method of, uh, you know, just taking everything out on credit. And for young people, particularly, um, there's no hope of owning a house anymore for a lot of people. Um, a lot of college graduates, uh, I mean, let's be real. Like most people shouldn't be going to college in the first place. And then when they graduate, they have virtually no prospects to get a job that they probably could have had they not gone to college. And then they're left saddling this huge amount of debt that they'll be holding till 65. And for them, it's a, it's a choice between, okay, do I want to live in an apartment and not raise a family and just take everything out on credit um, or work my ass off in order to get a job that will allow me to buy a house and raise a family? And many people, unfortunately, are choosing the latter. Um, I'm not one of them. Many people are choosing the latter, which is take everything out on credit, um, essentially just live that way, right? Um, if, if the end times are coming, 
Um, and for you, there are no prospects because you made huge mistakes when you were younger. Um, why not, uh, you know, not spend any of your actual money, just spend money borrowed from someone else. And so the consumer, particularly young people are, are propping themselves up on the buy now, pay later schemes. Um, and as a result of that, you're seeing headlines about a record breaking black Friday. And then you dig into it a little bit deeper and compared to last year, the amount of uh, spending that was done on buy now, pay later screens schemes is like doubled or tripled. And so that's not necessarily a sign of a, a strong consumer, but it is telling me that consumers are getting more savvy in order to spend. And so usually at this point in the cycle, it's like, you know, we've gone from uh, a 0% policy rate just, um, you know, 18 months ago to a five and a half percent policy rate now uh, in as of July, so within 15 months or 16 months. That's a huge amount of tightening. Usually at that stage, um, a con the consumer would be, you know, in a in a blood choke and going unconscious. But now all these buy now, pay later schemes, all these other things, um, burning through excess saving, uh, and, and plenty of them because of the pandemic, uh, this cycle is unlike any other. At this stage where consumers will normally be hurting, sure, they're hurting. Um, but but it, it certainly isn't uh, isn't causing an economic recession by the the measurement of GDP growth at the very least, right? That's where we're at right now. I mean, uh, I view a recession um, as uh, obviously we're, we're closer to a recession than we were several months ago. Obviously, um, I, I the, the conditions are now such that I think we're we're only a few months away, if not just one or two quarters away from this thing really kicking into uh into high gear. But again, who knows? We had a very strong holiday season. Uh, and like I said, this this cycle is super unprecedented. So hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars worth of uh monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus mailed directly to people's doors. Um a great deal of fraud that went unchecked during all of that. So really uh everything has been thrown into a tizzy. Who knows how how much money who had, right? Uh, and because of that, very hard to measure these traditional measurements and use to gauge whether or not we're in a recession and also try to be like, try to be our signpost for how close one is. That's kind of where we're at right now. Um, it's a, it's an interesting cycle. It's unlike any other cycle. Um, but so, so really amongst all that, the big thing to watch is, uh, is excess saving, right? Excess household savings. And at long last, they're nearing where they were right towards the start of the pandemic when the stimulus really started kicking off, right? Um, when, when the handouts and the helping really started kicking off. And so monitoring that and when it gets to at and below 2020 levels, uh, that's, you know, the stage when things really start to get hairy. Uh, and we're approaching that. So depending on, on, on what tricks people have left up their sleeve, uh, we could be looking at a recession within a quarter. We could be looking at a recession in three quarters. Well, I was just about to ask, and you kind of mentioned it a little bit at the end there, but do you think the can can be kicked further down the road? Do you think there could be any further stimulus schemes or anything along those kind of lines that, like I said, would delay any recession, would prolong the more bullish traditional market conditions we've had? I know the stock market and the economy aren't necessarily one and the same, but like I said, do you think that this could be extended even further and further? Right. So... Yeah, I'm very optimistic, um, frankly, because when it comes to corporate credit, right, we obviously in GDP, consumer spending isn't the isn't the only part of the bucket. It's it's just spending. That's what it's measured by. And the other cohort of people that spend are corporations. And so then you look at you look at corporations and what their debt uh, profile is like. And the reality is that they were very savvy during 2020 and 2021. Obviously, you know, during 2008, everyone got caught off guard. Um, huge rate heightened cycle uh, caught plenty of players um, with their pants down unprepared. In 2020, they got this huge, you know, it, it, it was unprecedented because rates were slammed to zero and every major media outlet was saying that this is the end of the world. And so what did most corporations do? Most corporations around America, well, they refinanced their debt near zero percent and they pushed out their maturity wall or when they would need to borrow again to several years in the future and the average corporate maturity wall in the united states doesn't hit we don't hit the tallest point the maturity wall 
until 2025. And so there's still a pretty decent buffer before when the majority of U.S. companies start to get the Granted, yes, many are experiencing uh, disappointing earnings. Frankly, they're kind of they're kind of volatile. They can go really neither direction. Um, but when these companies need to borrow again, it's all the way out to 2024 and 2025. And so the Fed rate hikes, um, because of the, sat- the the amount of fiscal uh, stimulus that was put to the economy and, and monetary stimulus, consumers have this huge pile of excess saving. The one going now, granted, it's still a huge pile of excess saving. And uh, companies, it pushed out their maturity wall several years in the future to 2025. And so where the Fed's rate hikes at this stage in the cycle will usually be really way on, on consumers and corporates, now they have it. That huge buff. It's only still optimistic. Um, until I see evidence of uh, you know corporate borrowing beginning to, to have to ramp up and corporate credit spreads, as evidenced by uh, corporate credit spreads, really really widening. Um, you know, I have uh, I have no reason to believe it like a huge downturn. Um, but uh, again, as those key you know, those key dates approach, I, I think earnings will continue to disappoint as consumer begins dwindling. Uh, uh, and I think that when we approach 2025, it's called maturity wall, credit spreads begin to widen up. And those are the two real hallmarks of when not uh, only see it, the meat of the down. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. I can definitely see how that would play out, especially like you said, with all of the refinancing potentially coming in 2025. Hopefully we have a little bit longer for Bitcoin to hopefully continue its uptrend, but like we said before, and, and Bitcoin's correlation to especially the NASDAQ, do you see any circumstance or situation in which Bitcoin could potentially decouple? I know you mentioned before that gold isn't that hedge asset. Do you foresee any future in which Bitcoin is that hedge asset? And maybe even in an economic downturn, we see a decoupling and Bitcoin outperform most things. So I don't think that that point comes until... Um, Bitcoin has a much higher market cap. And when it has a much higher market cap, that's kind of a sign to me that it's a much more mature asset. Though people people understand what it is. Um, I tend to look at it like the gold market cap over 10 trillion. Uh, the gold market cap is 13 trillion right now, I'm not sure. But when Bitcoin approaches the market capitalization of the much larger assets, uh, those assets that are considered risk off, I think at that stage, the market begins trading it like the asset that it is instead of what it's traded like currently. So right now it's traded like the NASDAQ, but you and I both know that Bitcoin is not the NASDAQ, the way you have your farm companies go into and out of the NASDAQ 100 index. Um, these companies all have earnings. companies are all be bold into interest rate risks. These companies are all in on revenue. Um, whereas Bitcoin, of course, is this, uh, this completely neutral asset um, that people buy for the sake of gold. Completely new because even gold has industrial application. Whereas Bitcoin, uh, it does it, its express purpose on um, these for people to uh, buy and of course transact. And so, because this is kind of a very new, new sort of asset that's supposed to trade more in the vein of gold or something that you want to allocate and sit in, like you have strategies, people are trading it like that. If they hear online coin, oh, that's, that sounds like a tech company. X. And so you've seen Bitcoin's correlation with NASDAQ very, very high. And Bitcoin trades very sensitively to those risk swings. So when the market is very heavily stocked, it is right now, right? Um, then Bitcoin appreciates, like I said earlier, by 126% in a year where the NASDAQ only appreciated by 37%, right? So really high beta stuff. Uh, and, and of course, that's partly a function of the fact that it's so small. Bitcoin is right now, it's still sub one trillion market, right? It's very volatile. That's a result of that. Um, you know, sell offs in the S P five hundred, um, couldn't be S P five hundred by ten percent, but that same sell off on an asset basis in the uh, in Bitcoin, if we're talking in dollar at the dollar term, could send Bitcoin down by sixty percent, right? Um it's just a matter of Bitcoin being much smaller than these assets. Also, the trade in like the NASDAQ, despite it not being NASDAQ, NASDAQ, or buy or sit in, 
And of course, rare cases, not, not, not rare cases, but cases not here in the West, uh, in the Eastern world where people don't have property rights um, to transact, right? Uh, people are really not understanding that it's this risk on asset that it is. I think that understanding comes with a much higher market cap. Uh, and so as we, as we approach the market cap of gold, um, as we approach the market cap of U.S. treasuries, then I think, of course, Bitcoin gets less volatile as you get up there. Then eventually, I, I believe correlation. I believe it's correlations uh, with the traditional risk markets. I believe they, they flip uh, at that stage. But we're still a ways away from that. I have a feeling the ETF is going to help to some degree, but also not because the ETF is going to be traded primarily, uh, obviously by little guys trying to get some exposure, people in there retiring out a long exposure, people who want to buy ETFs seek the NLC platform, they buy it in stocks. But, mo- but, but the institutional players who are trading it like the NASDAQ, they're going to see trading like the NASDAQ. So yeah, we're getting a lot more liquidity, so it's becoming a little volatile. But I don't think that the uh, inflow that we get from ETFs will help Bitcoin's correlations change all that much. I think the correlation shift is going to come of course, with liquidity, but liquidity coming into a uh, spot of Bitcoin. And of course, in order that happen, there need to be many more avenues for that that are sleep yet. Um, so we're, we're a few factors um, coupled with, of course, that, that huge price, appre- uh, price appreciation towards 5 trillion, 10 trillion, 20 trillion away from Bitcoin, a really the correlation, trading like the asset that it should, that it is, instead of the asset that people think it is. And so, that's a huge informational arbitrage, frankly. Um, you can get Bitcoin on the cheap during kind of crisis, which is when Bitcoin should be trading at its highest. So that won't be around forever, right? While while that correlation is still here, take advantage of it. Uh, if recessions are predictable and you know that during recession, Bitcoin does not do well, Bitcoin's never had a prolonged recession. Well, right? So if recessions are predictable, and this this one that's coming up is maybe the most predictable because it's been pushed out and pushed out and pushed out as the results of all the nonsense happened in 2021. And you know, Bitcoin at an extreme discount. Predictable, right? So while this informational arbitrage is here, take full advantage of it. We'll be here forever. I'm glad you mentioned informational arbitrage because I've heard you mention it multiple times in your reports and stuff. And I think it's a, a great phrase for it. How would you consider, or how do you think most people perceive Bitcoin as an asset class currently especially given its correlation to the NASDAQ, do you think it is just speculative beta? Do you think it has a novelty aspect to it? Do you think it is fulfilling its purpose as a peer-to-peer electronic currency? How do you think it is currently perceived and how long, I know you said $10 trillion, but how long do you think it will take before that general perception changes to this hedge asset and and it really fulfills its potential? Right. So you said it, uh, it's perceived as speculative beta. So people that want their portfolios to, you know, have that exposure during these, uh, these huge market swings, they'll go long or short Bitcoin in whatever they have access to. Um, they'll out a little bit good because on a, on the basis of risk adjusted returns, just introducing a little bit of Bitcoin into your portfolio as the institution of that, it complete, uh, completely uh, throws your returns um, you know, into a new echelon. Uh, like, you know, for example, if you add like five or two Bitcoin to more, or, you know, if you're, let's say you're, you're me, you know, let's say just that primarily risk based portfolio, I made a portfolio that cost me in there. Um, you, you know, five, five percent, you allocate five percent of your, your portfolio, but you're going to experience returns that are 20 percent higher, higher. This thing, is an asset and it is increasingly an asset that is used by managers to soak up that beta. Um, which won't be around forever. Bitcoin will not be a low liquidity asset. We'll be growing. Uh, so it is, it is viewed as speculative beta now. And that's why I view that when that beta goes away, Bitcoin becomes less desirable compared to, to small it and big individual stock. Unless we're talking, unless we're talking about the, the use case that Bitcoin is that superior to other assets, it's that scarce. Uh, you know, in, in that it becomes 
you can model a new world or stop or because that's why that's down to the goal, right? But ultimately, um, gold is not proven to be very good hence because out your price. Uh, if you if you better rolling against the GPI dollars, you're getting destroyed in the last several days. Where Bitcoin um, story. And so over time, uh, Bitcoin will begin to trade that way as the luster of it being a high beta risk at space. That's what I think. That's what I view. I think you can also talk to Razor and take it through the bottom solution. I think that's the way things are gonna things are gonna change. Right now it's high beta risk. As it grows, that high beta fades. The its natural property is as an asset under the floor. And that would be the main reason people want to trade it. People want to hold it, right? Not trade it, hold it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think as its luster would be high beta risk asset fade and its true property is as an asset under the floor. As why it's created and how it's achieved better above. So in a similar fashion to how most people get into Bitcoin and think number go up and then eventually learn about its scarcity, like you said, and its properties and its actual potential for fulfillment on a global scale, that's going to happen on an institutional and potentially national scale as well, where, like you said, it's a speculative beta asset until people actually realize its potential and it can fulfill this hedge asset label. It's it's interesting how everyone kind of goes through the same process, regardless if we're putting a few hundred dollars in or a few billion dollars. It's a, a similar process. So I was going to say, do you think the four-year Bitcoin cycle is going to continue as it grows in size? Do you think the halving is going to continue to have an impact? Do you think the halving actually has as big an impact as it many people maybe think? Or do you think it's coincidentally aligned with liquidity cycles? How do you see Bitcoin's cyclical nature going forward right so as long as i mean the thought is the, these halvings are happening while bitcoin is really really small um well okay let's back up so when it comes to the halving it's a it's a an event completely unique to bitcoin and uh it's one that has allowed it um when it's a, you know, as it's been a very small asset and most of it has been absorbed rather quickly, most of the new supply has been absorbed rather quickly, um, by, by particularly during the, the bull cycle. Um, I think economic cycles, market cycles immediately align, um, with Bitcoin in the past that when there is a high demand for Bitcoin and most of the new supply on the market can get mid be purchased, then, yeah. Yeah, that uh, the supply chain to schedule a cap, I think those two factors combined will have Bitcoin to really appreciate exceedingly well. As long as we're in a risk-not environment, I think you, you know the having will continue to be needed. Uh, of course, on a longer time horizon, the having is always needed because it ends with no more Bitcoin left to be it. Um, and on a more micro level, it needs less Bitcoin being issued on any given day. And so when there is demand, when it's it's chasing after an increasingly more fleeting supply and feel it. Um it's just a matter of like do you feel it will you view it and will you see the price the same way you did last cycle during this cycle? Uh, that all depends. That day. uh rarely depends on whether or not we're still in this risk on phase when that comes around. Um when it had it comes around the people. I think that had it really close to the earth I'm not sure the folly had on the earth. I think we're scheduled for April 17th at the minute. Okay, so a couple of days away. Um, um, yeah, let, let's hope that for whatever reason, the demand for Bitcoin um, falls off a cliff uh, over the next several days. The pattern B gets pushed out on the good blocks or uh, plus radio. Okay. Um, that'd be really cool. Anyway, and one of those two things line up, I think you see it pretty easy price. I think, uh, you know, if, if we take it with words and, uh, Let's say something cataclysmic happens to the real economy. People shift out of their risks, uh, they need to shift out of their beta into you know, those, those need to stay assets for US treasuries. Yield fall, you allocate treasuries, um, and all that will need to support something that's massive Bitcoin. 
then I think having a little less new pack, it's going to be a lot demand for new Bitcoin out of any given debt. But right now, what Bitcoin is breaking eye after eye, you know, you get out to the market mill art, these conditions stick around for the tag anchors. Um, we're right we're in for a treat should uh, get get approved for them because then uh, this will be the first having where the novel fee of the buy schedule will be cut now will be available as a tradable event that's um institutions love tradable events love tradable love trading around a seeding they love trading um around uh, big economic data releases love tradable events and this will be the first bitcoin having where it's been available to institutional investors to play as a tradable event. It'll be interesting. It's, it'll be the first time that we're seeing this mass meatball or liquidity that is ostensibly all the way uh, trading the Bitcoin out. It'll be really cool. We'll see. We'll see if it was, I, I, I don't know when the PPG comes to you. But we'll see. It's a curious behavior around that about the PPG at large. And uh, whether or not at a bet like this really means you had a lot of first time. Could make Bloomberg have the very first time. Thought about it on Bloomberg technology. There could be a countdown on Bloomberg technology um, during the normal daily show. Who knows, right? Um, I think if should the ETF be approved for now, by all accounts, will be several ETFs will be approved at once, but the, the, the dog that's going to happen. Um, and then we're still in these really good conditions. I think you're going to have to see the happening really. Um, but should economic calamity occur before that, and people are interested in how to get a the risk, you'll, you'll see how well. But that's just, um, that's conjecture. It's conjecture with a little bit of reasoning behind it, but it's most very little. Longer. So we've discussed a lot of the demand for Bitcoin in terms of investors, institutions, corporations, etc. How do you think Bitcoin could be best used for Everyday folk, you and I, do you think we're going to see a lot of, I suppose we're getting more into the philosophical future of Bitcoin, but rather than just as a vehicle for profit potential, do you think Bitcoin could actually aid in third world countries like we see in El Salvador and other nations? Do you think it can actually be this revolutionary peer-to-peer -peer currency or is it just, like I said, uh, something to drive profits for the for the rich guy? So... At the end of the day, the West and the East, and when I say the West and the East, I don't mean like the West Coast of the United States. Obviously, you know what I'm talking about, right? The global. Yeah, yeah. Um, they had two different very use cases in Bitcoin, right? In El Salvador, um, you chances are, right, you may be Bitcoin for transactability. In a country like Nigeria, where you do not have property rights, uh, you're probably using Bitcoin for its transactability at censorship. Whereas here in the West, Particularly in the United States, we're not to worry about it. If you're in Canada, you probably are a little bit more worried about it, right? You suggest you know, uh, for you to make it out to the flight. So, as the game continues, where there's a massive debt problem here in the United States, and the implicit way to fix it is allowing price inflation to run out of the fields, killing the wealth of uh, retirees and the people who own the U.S. dollar in general, other dollar denominated assets. Here in the West, the I mean, use case of Bitcoin becomes holding an asset in your portfolio that heads against that directly benefits in the face of unfettered price. Right? If I have an asset that keeps scarce and the solution cycle, cycle is to create more money, not only to uh, resolve the, uh, the you know economic slowdown very quickly um, without anybody feeling without a prolonged economic recession. That's something that the Fed and the U.S. government do not want. They don't want to grow out of the session. That's why they, one of the reasons why they choose to they play the money buy and school fund to bail us out of trouble. Um, but also because it's a mass debt problem at the government level, and instead of being fiscally austere, they choose to continue issuing more debt. And the, the way that they're paying down this debt is by saving off, having to pay it off, Issuing more debt on price inflation to run hotter than nominal yield. So it's a roadie value that they're kind of has to buck off the US citizen in the form of price inflation. And so for the everyday person who has lost point by one, the value of their retirement account go down from 350000 
to 199,000 watching it come out and eat. No idea what's going on. Um, for the people who have seen gas prices rise consistently from sub two sub two dollars two thousand every thousand dollar point to now um three fifty here in Massachusetts if you're lucky five dollars in California if you're lucky. Um the people who have seen the cost of groceries, uh, the grocery bill, usually they can get plenty of things that room for more meat you bought for dinner. I have plenty of room for a teacher or two during the year, but people who are now on that speed buying the exact same groceries with really a paycheck. The solution for that individual out of the portion of wealth they bought, uh, because it appreciates the space to the inevitable end for every single market that got on cycle. It's money. So at an individual level, out of the Bitcoin saves you from this quality that your leader do not care about the in any way she perform are doing to you every single day uh, in the West. So uh, that is the primary use. East, uh, I say more direct to transactability, censorship resistance. But in the West, it's essentially a monetary middle figure to the you know, monetary leader, writ large, the government leaders uh, who got itself a new pickle and they're using you as a scapegoat. Right? You are productive economically, you produce real values, the government going to take you. Obviously, they take you the ball tax. Everybody knows that. But if they, they take you the bless you the money, they'll send them out of trouble. They'll take buddies out of trouble. All the while, asking about up to you. Only big player face that big monitor. They'll send all that money that they print in my previous but I love it. So, two vast different new states. But I break. I can completely agree with that. You mentioned that you can see inflation continuing to get hotter specifically in the west i know you're u.s based how rampant do you think inflation could get in the coming years do you think we could see double digit inflation a few years down the line i know inflation in terms of real inflations not necessarily been increasing as fast but like you said for nation states to potentially get themselves out of this debt problem or could just compound the issue and kick the can down the road how bad do you think inflation could get before maybe economies start really breaking? Sorry, can you repeat the, the bat out? How hot do you think inflation can realistically get? No. Well, <laughs> I mean, you see, you've seen in Argentina, it can get to 100% for years on end, and they still only narrowly elect a guy and he's going to fix it. So, I mean, it can get pretty hot. I mean, people yeah. are really dumb. I hate to say it, uh, and, and it's a very, very rude thing to say, but um, the majority of people, particularly the voting bloc in many Western countries, are really dumb, and that's not to the, the, the any fault of their own. I mean, from birth, essentially, they're propagating that, believing that the government is apt and sets the, and uh, if it weren't for the central bank, uh, we'd be living in uh, you know, abject poverty. Right? The central bank is, is what uh, provides stability for the U.S. economy. That is the way that most of the voting bloc states the last, or at the very least, they just think these things are absolute necessities. Um, you know, if it, you know, it's not, it's not that people are dull, it's that they've been propagandized or very well, most people are 95%. So realistically, uh, Argentina as our case study, you can have terrible living and people will still only nearly elect the guy who's five or that he's going to fix them. Uh, so and then it becomes a matter of okay, what what is the actual problem? Like how hot can inflation get not before people elect the guy or realist here in the West, um where the risks are teetering increasingly toward deflation. We've had swift disinflation. Of course, we had a hiccup. We fell to like 2.9%, 2.98, it was around a 3% uh, price inflation. But of course, it's bogus. We know CPI is bogus, but we don't see that, that we're getting. Uh, so we, we, uh, we, we fell to 3% price inflation, rose like 3.3% price inflation uh, over the course of a few months, and now it's falling again. Um, I have a feeling that was a minor hiccup. As we approach the end of this cycle where consumers are 
close in on the end of the rope, uh, whether burning, action savings are at pre pandemic level, at, at just at post pandemic level. Um, and uh, more great to recruit the other charity wall. Uh, I tend to think that uh, spending, this could have been the last uh, last Black Friday cycle who are rate invading the amazing uh, A couple of notable trends for that. A, with primarily online shopping, where it can deal or mostly real. You put a discount loaded and be in the most real. Um, B, there was a lot of shopping that was good. It's like, yeah, that would be need. Of the, but there are outlets here in the United States that are difficult outlets. Uh, wait, I remember. But um, a lot of shopping going on with tax resetting. Uh, and, like I said, three times more buy out and later buy last Black Friday. We only see when our car public money is That's a fact based on access savings, uh, credit card delinquencies, all these things tell us the same thing. So if spending is slow, like price inflation is probably down to five, four to people buying things. Wow. Uh, deflation is on the other side of all. Uh, well, this inflation, it's the price just the ride and slow rate. Deflation on the other side. And I think that uh, as long as the Fed keeps finger fear or pressure on that rule, not there yet, uh, but the risks are such that this inflation, mm-hmm. so like this inflation, and even deflation are, are a higher risk than recovery. Um, but in cycles out, I mean, let's be real, the ant repeated me that common cycle and it breaks widening out. So if you view like the economic cycle, if you view the economy in sideways, you know, up and down and up and down and up and down, around this need, that column and the economic response, then through time, pre Federal Reserve, it's kind of like this, was micro cycles. The federal Reserve gets created, all of a sudden they can bail out their buddies, get all this money, and then all of a sudden on um, the crash got larger. And then they resolve it with even more monitoring because and then the crash got larger. So that because all these players that were supposed to get read back here were hot rate. They were bailed out. Uh, at an individual level, at a local level, level um crash battle blurred. And then in twenty twenty, the the monetary you know, totally impressed off the street. And now we're at a doubt or a that if we're like great. Then that value growth playing great year. We're right here. We're still growing, but not nearly by a lot. We're not nearly as strong because we're up here in some way. And like every other cycle previous, the crash will be that much larger. In twenty twenty we had kind of like a micro crash, but uh you know, prolonged recession what's on the other end of all of this. Of course, the Fed doesn't allow prolonged resetting because that would be the bad players get reads. And on a global scale, we can't let that happen. Can't let the United States, well, I said we be for the US government, but they can't let the United States be the weakest link in the global economy uh, for a long period of time. So, monetary efficiency, let's go war on the other side of it. Uh, and so, that's, that's what's coming on the other end of it. Uh, I know what we're going to question about. How hot can inflation run? Um, right, the risk right now are disinflation and deflation. But on the other end of this, when we have this huge influx of monetary stimulus, who knows? We might, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, we might see not then again. But the reality is, trade is coming off track to some degree. Um, I could be wrong about this, but it could have just been one transient period during COVID, uh, where as a result of that flat graph, we did the Ensuing response where even after the economy is full of money, maybe that is what caused 9% price inflation year, year on year. But I tend to think that the amplitude of these sites is wide and that it's the easiest way, most less to be. Um, that as the debt problem grows larger and larger, as the money supply grows larger and larger, the out script, uh, leads growth, economic growth, um, the out, you sit really wide in that gap. You do. Uh, I envy just becoming more difficult for our monetary leaders control it all. And as a result of that, the amplitude of the site by today, you would see higher price, higher peak price inflation. It's like going to be harder for them to be in that for a lot of environment reality. So for now, sum it all up, this inflation and deflation are the risks for this cycle, but longer term result than market, like the tree coming off the tracks and not like the tracks rather. 
I have a million white sheep, blue eye, that cycle. Where are you? Very good. Very, I think you covered pretty much every base possible there. Uh, but leading on a bit from what you said regarding the Fed and central banks and they don't want to lose grip and control and, and want to promote more consumerism, more debt, more credit to really amplify these waves of, of the economy and, and essentially the markets. Do you think CBDCs could be utilized by the Fed and central banks? Do you think if CBDCs were implemented in Western economies, that would pose a threat to Bitcoin? So here in the United States, we we are one of the last nations on earth that had even a large job. So not to get violent or revolutionary or anything like that. But obviously the, the camera and microphone are rolling on my phone. The FBI in here on the other side of the screen is the same that we went out in here. I, I have a feeling C D C will go a very long way. I feel like restricting what people can or can't purchase will go a very long way be very popular um you know you're seeing now in ireland um the government passed laws they passed laws earlier this year there's a huge outcry against what's going on over there the immigration laws and laws were passed bad opposition and i have a feeling that laws could never have been passed had ireland been an armed media so the reason I acknowledge it that is because what CBDC would help the Fed control in great ways, ways, if all of your money was digital and it was sitting in a wallet and they wanted you to spend it because the economy was slowing, they could just impose negative interest rates onto your money. Losing value. You better go spend it. You better go spend it. You're losing value. Money is losing value. You better go spend it. That could happen in the United States if not ours. Uh, I have a feeling that a mass rollout of a big digital wallet like this will go right. Particularly after what they did here, people are a little bit more disagree. Right? Maybe if COVID hadn't happened, if people said, hey, we're rolling out digital money, just turn in all your cash to us. We'll give you this new digital money in this digital wallet, and we'll also give you a free Dunkin' Donuts gift card. People are about like, Dunkin' Donuts. And you have the government all their money, get CBDC, the retirees, and all of a sudden, uh, now 60% of America will have it. All the CBCs, and that's how the Fed controls the interest rate. It's a lot of I have a feeling A, because people are not as screwed with well, COVID, and B, um, in our country, I have a feeling it's going to be difficult to hear or possible given the amount of people who are outwardly articulating why CBDC is such a bad, terrible, terrible thing. Uh, I have a feeling that, that at least here in the United States, it's going to be very difficult for them to have uh, for, for people to, for the government to vote the vote. Otherwise, the nations, uh, I mean, much easier. I, but we'll see. I, CBDCs would be great for Fed and the, the Treasury because it would allow them to control economic cycles way more. Um, it would allow them to issue their debt far easier if they could just swap out cash and wallets for Treasuries. Obviously, there's this entrenched demand for Treasuries. So they don't really need to force people to buy that, but it certainly wouldn't hurt to pull up citizenry to hold a percentage of the wealth in the Treasury of the government. Uh, more than they already do by the back by one. But um, that would be the benefit uh, of CDCs here in the West for the government. But again, it's because of the reason that let's I don't think that I don't think that they're, they're gonna go they're gonna go uh, that implementation, that rollout is gonna go as smoothly as the government knew. Fair enough. I know my cousins across the lake certainly have a way with guns and Certainly wanting to make their voice heard, kind of like the French just south of us. Definitely uh, definitely up for some riots. But if there was hypothetically a situation in which the US and subsequently the US dollar potentially wasn't the number one global currency, maybe if there was other alternate international currencies for global trade were implemented and utilized across BRICS nations, for example, do you think that could change the market dynamics specifically within the US if they weren't the de facto leader in, in terms of their currency being the most utilized globally for trade? Yeah, so, you know, I think that uh, obviously if the US dollar was being, um, it would be, uh, it would be, not, you know, the next most holding currency. Uh, pretty sure I have zero. 
uh, could be wild. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read on that, but and, and then, you know, after that, it would be any number of periods to see over the piece. Um, I think, uh, in terms of like imposing restrictions, uh, it'd be much easier with those current seats, uh, imposing capital control. Obviously, here in the United States, you do that very easily, very handily. Uh, but I think you, you'd see it on a lot of much more out airy or the little. Uh, I do view Rick said, uh, a real non starter though, primarily because I've, I've analogized the study students really you we love it and um the u.s dollar is and right now world reserve currency it's not something that can be like a lot of blood back in because people don't need the dollar desirable anymore mm-hmm. uh and so they and you won't get plugged in a lot of the reason people will say that is they're a political pundit trying to get elected and so they'll go China is threatening the U.S. dollar. They'll never explain what they mean by that. Um, usually what they mean is that our economy is pretty poorly, therefore the dollar is threat. But if you're real, do we think that what's happening here is not also happening in China? Right? Like, think about it this way. So like we, we have a, the most liquid currency in the world. Following COVID, following the pandemic lockdowns that were most global, in China especially, uh, really are locked out. Uh, they have the same response that we do. Right? It's an obscene amount of money. It would be considered lower. But, so, if that was a response globally, but we have the most of the currency, that means we experience fallout of all that mud flats. So we experience that, right? But these other countries experience 10, 20, 50, 100, several years in a row. So, like, the problem we have over here, unfettered inflation, huge debt problem. Much worse out of West to East, even East to East, right? That, so, U.S. dollar does its job. Problems that we're facing economically are faced by other nations a lot higher. So, there are really no reason to believe that the dollar can be kicked out as um, if the United States economy had a whole slew of problems that simply weren't being carried by other people. If people were divesting, you know, especially it's investing. In uh, other sovereign debt at a at a, at a recent clip because we were issuing an obscene amount of debt in other countries work. Uh, maybe maybe just maybe you would see a transition toward another world currency. Even that would be a multi year multi decade process. Uh, so not just last Steve doing it, but the lack of it if it is for me. Uh, I think breaks is kind of a non starter, even though it is very fat to talk about because. I hate the United States uh, government uh, and uh, its fiscal policy and the Fed and monetary policy is much the next guy. But I think the reality is, I don't think I know the reality is now that we still have it best comparatively to everyone else in the world. Then we the body that's best. Uh, uh, the next pat- best uh, monetary thing per se. But, uh, but that's what I'll say. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, yeah. I wrote a I wrote a blog on piece on it. I wrote a few uh, over at the Bitcoin Layer, which is part of the Bitcoin Layer dot com, and then uh, search out Rick's blog you know, like, about it. Great. So before everyone goes to the Bitcoin Layer to read up all your great content, could you give a best and well, not best and worst. We'll say a bull and a bear case price prediction for Bitcoin at the next all time high. Do you think the next all-time high comes? Let Let's say you said there's there's a a certain credit cycle that's kind of coming to an end in 2025. So let's just say we won't give specific dates, but yeah, at Bitcoin's next all-time high, what do you see as a bullish case and a bearish case for that? Right. So this is a fun one. I love the. Uh, I enjoy talking about credit predictions like this time to time. It's not the main thing that I do, obviously, but like. It's a fun, fun little thought I decide. Well, we do do it. I think um, over a hundred thousand dollars. Like, uh, each we look at first it was three thousand, and then it was ten thousand, and then it was twenty thousand, and it was six thousand. And so, each I mean, one hundred twenty thousand is obviously the most uh, the simplest one to look at. Um, but also, you got to think about it. Sure. 
each time it, it decreased in magnitude. Um, bar and you know, the all I decreased the magnitude. Well, three doubt and that was three X. And that was played out in those two. And played out three thousand three X two. So, you know, kind of fun from there. But if we're talking like market cap, you need an insane amount of money to net like multi I don't need to use that one triple. But uh, uh again, it's gonna be sustainable I thought the trade is coming on tracks despite the you know, like the widening out. So uh I think one hundred twenty out see if that will be low on my floor dog. And then it's like wow, then you know if uh if the reset for shallow it you know it'd be answer it monetary fields lower could see what I doubt or even somewhat on a doubt but that's like low from not uh, but if we have stream monitoring that what's um following the for large that that monetary I mean sticks around post bullet side we could see it under twenty or more. But I think that one would be more me right now. That could age really quick who knows um nuclear bot that we all knew this or uh, but I think the article out is a state. Okay, so I'll write it down. Bull case, 120,000, bear case, nuclear war, and we're all vaporized. So that's quite extreme ends of the scale. Where do you think we could be at the halving event, April 17th, around your birthday? What, what would you like to wake up on your birthday morning and see Bitcoin's price at? But if, if, uh, if correlations stay where they are, which, uh, who knows? New home sales uh, data that's came in extremely difficult here in the US. Clearly, there's a downturn in the way. Um, if correlations stay where they are, um, we could see Bitcoin uh, higher than 40,000, higher than 45,000 uh, in April. Correlations begin to shift um, with more risk off. You are probably going to see some 30,000 Bitcoin at the halving. And if you see an economic model line prior to that, you're going to see. Wow, uh, you know, big point uh, moving close to do is twenty point below the pivot lower from that. So a variety of different scenarios. Uh, ideally I'd like to wake up in the first scenario that I talked about, but uh again yeah, the cycle is like no other. And that's why I need a three options. Well added on on uh, map origin model uh, we're in big risk up here in big point, very highly expected to follow it. So it's very highly sensitive to wherever the tide uh, at flows, more traders are, uh, what traders are doing. It's, of course, heading into a large degree to the weather in our meat. My, my short answer is well, it's a, okay, I'll take it. Do you think the ETF has a big influence on that? Do you think uh, an ETF rejection points as, more towards the the bearish outcome of bullish ETF approval gets as close to that forty thousand dollar price level, or do you think it's maybe being a bit overblown the short term impact of a ETF approval rejection? Obviously, there'd be a huge amount of volatility and speculation upon that news being announced. But do you think over the next kind of six months that actually has a huge underlying impact on the Bitcoin price? Yeah, it does uh, more than I thought. Is if you look at the sheer heat price on during all of this uh, the last three or four weeks in the lunar cycle for the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah, uh, it will it will have a huge impact. It's, if Bitcoin is trading like this off of the lunar well, I imagine what that would actually actually start a leap. Well, if, if they are there, advertised being there for ages, we need to just keep their mind and just invest in a chomping at the out. And they thought, you know, that's that you're not really well now. You know, the data points would be you're in the Uh but a big a spot big one ETF, not several, not all of them are going in out in there. Yeah, you know. Uh, but again, right, it, it all depends on where the body is I mean, these institutional investors are the body in the way that they the way that they will um the way that they'll not themselves based on what the prevailing market is doing, or so whether or not you're completely unwound, um, the fact that uh, it's said to be a problem, so, uh, so, so, 
I think that uh, again, if you see, uh, I'll open the call low heel to the uh, line. I bet if you, that's uh, you can see it in the bottom here and see that, um, but uh, we did not put that on the three. I mean, well, then we probably do that. Well, I will kind of look at it. Yeah. Very level headed response. Uh, and finally, I know this is complete speculation, impossible to predict, but Bitcoin in three decades. Could you give a wildly speculative bull and bear case price prediction for Bitcoin in 2050? Yeah, Otter, we do So for any, for any listeners and viewers, it's not something I regularly do or say. Um, that last response that I gave, response that I was giving, are the kind of stuff you'll find in the Bitcoin layer on my Twitter account. Um, BitcoinLayer.com. That energy there, but uh, fun little this is a fun little odd guy, right? Between no, now in 2050, probably have uh, maybe just more economic cycle five or six, and so uh, probably more of a certain then. Uh, and so if that's the case, then you're going to see it fall in, you know, like you reach some kind of legal high. Um, Within all, the all, the U.S. Treasury's own estimate is that public debt to GDP will be in one hundred percent by twenty fifty. Yeah. Wow. What's it currently at? Sorry, just to interrupt. Is it about one hundred and twenty? Okay. Well, um, if that is the stated plan of the U.S. government, then what they're telling you is that they plan on issuing debt that outstrips that value. And we know that they intend on that via burning down the value of that money if they can use that by monetary credit by, by keeping rates as low as possible for as long as possible um, and allow price inflation to run hard. And we know when price inflation was hot, when new money is projected to be a lot of you know, big part appreciate the face of that. But if we're going through five or six, four cycle when credit flips the plan, Will allow that GDP to run at 100%. We know on the face of all that net is um, it's going to be even the higher monetary debates that we're pouring down the value of that new debt. You know, Bitcoin will depreciate the very outside manner over the next three decades. So, now three decades, you know, I, I would say um, 500,000 Bitcoin, 500,000 Bitcoin, then you'll need to hire the applauder to play for better quality deviation by the time we reach a decade now I, I've been before these will have started to shift three decades now I'll let draw um, hopefully that won't be what it started I, I think that will be what it started the ask that it is um, and uh, $500,000 probably not I hope that that doesn't be on the title of the video water handles also I, I promise I won't do that. We're, you're, you're far too sensible for that. I'll, it's just a fun little exercise at the end. So, as I said, worst case, nuclear war, we're all vaporized. Best case, half a million. That's the title, actually. I might change it to that. So, I think you've said that you're from the Bitcoin layer. You've, you've said that you've got some great content into it, which I can definitely vouch for, and some amazing YouTube content. Do you have anything else you'd like to inform the viewers of before we say goodbye? Um, I wouldn't, I'd say try to, uh, uh, be optimistic, obviously the, you know, not just the, the economy is doing all that, but, uh, or more and more people are destitute, they go out of cycle. I know that there is a solution. I have some big part, part of that solution, but the other part of that solution is to, uh, is to actively work to improve your life and your health. Um, two weeks people will spend, will spend a great deal of the day of your being up. Become enveloped and literally for all that it's not exceed and become discouraged. Um, I would say don't be discouraged and just be more lives at all. Um uh, this certain campaign to totally ignore um the, the American people the need from the law to the American people. Um and try to need the law majority to be much to argue. So I'd say don't be demoralized. Um live a happy life, eat food really exercise regularly, but that you should part of the measure. And, uh, and uh, 
go go enjoy enjoy right have fun uh, that would be my right? more than anything monetary go enjoy right again certain effort to make you sad make you unhappy make you not optimistic about the future ignore all that noise dude. Well, what a lovely and beautiful sentiment and, and great note to end on. Thank you very much for coming on, Joe. It was, it was really nice to have you and have your expertise and, and lovely insights. Well, really not that lovely insights on where the economy may be headed in the coming months and years. But regardless, it was nice to hear, like I said, your expertise on the topic. So thank you very much to Joe. Thank you all very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.